Now, um, so if you guys haven't looked at that video, you're going to want to look at that video. Um, that that particular presenter for Weld.com is really good. Um, he's he's kind of like listening to Uncle Buck. He's kind of a, got this dry, sarcastic humor to him, but um, he's a really good welder. He really uh, they've got really good camera um, visualization, so it it really will help in just setting up the TIG welder. Um, so we want to get that done this week. Watch that video. Do that. Um, the worksheet that goes with that video. And then, as I said, I am going to have a video that's going to go with our presentation today. Um, I haven't put the, the worksheet on Canvas yet, so it will be on Canvas later this afternoon. And then if you're able to and you want to come in and try to do some TIG welding, um, this Friday, Open Lab, we're going to be trying to focus on TIG welding. If you want to come in and try the MIG welding that we were doing last week, you can do that as well. Um, but TIG welding is kind of our next progression that we're working towards. Um, next week, we're going to keep going with TIG welding, but we're going to be looking at TIG welding aluminum, which is a whole new um, area for you guys. TIG welding mild steel is pretty easy. TIG welding aluminum takes a lot more effort. Um, so what we're going to look at today is setting up our TIG welders that we have here in the shop. They're they're similar in operation to the TIG welder that you saw in the weld.com video, but the setup is distinctly different. Um, these are, we got some brand new TIG welders. I'm going to show them to you here in a minute. Um, they are in, they're what's called an inverter TIG welder. Um, they're, we bought these because they're kind of a little more user friendly. They don't have as many bells and whistles as the ones that were on the weld.com video but they're probably a little easier to set up. And I'm going to show you that setup right now. Um, so first things first, we're going to do a demonstration on some 16th inch sheet metal. This is just the stuff that we were using in the plasma cutter. I will tell you when you're TIG welding, um, thicker metal is easier to learn on than thin metal. So we'll probably use quarter inch when you guys come in. One of the things you need to be aware of, and they, he kind of outlined it. He, he said it, but he said it indirectly. When you're TIG welding, we need to have really, really clean metal. Back in Metals 1, when you were arc welding, yeah, we, we cleaned up the metal on the wire wheel, and that was fine. Um, and even when we're doing the wire feed welding, you guys that came in last week and we're doing the, the tubing welds, you know, again, we cleaned up the metal a little bit, but we weren't really, really focused on cleaning the metal. When you're TIG welding, clean metal is an absolute must. Now, this metal was brand new. However, it did sit on the plasma cutter. And because it was on the plasma cutter, it did start to get some rust on it, a little bit of rust on it. And the other thing he talked about was mill scale. Anytime you have hot rolled metal, you get a mill scale on it. So mill scale rust, any kind of uh, oil or anything like that on your metal absolutely needs to be cleaned off when you're TIG welding. We could take this to an angle grinder and I could grind it, but it's pretty thin metal, so I don't want to remove a lot of material. Just plain old emery cloth. It's just sandpaper cloth. I've got it in the back room. This works pretty good for mild steel. And I've already taken it on here and I just sanded this off. I went through and sanded it off really hard. And then it was one of the tricks that he actually did on, on that weld.com video. I, I haven't done in the past, but I recognized after he did it, wiping it off with a rag afterwards, you get all the impurities out of there. So if you look at that rag, you can see how much of that black soot came off there. All of that is going to create impurities when you're trying to TIG weld. So TIG welding is really about having nice, clean metal. Okay. Also, using acetone helps get rid of oils. I do that sometimes. Yep, yep. And we, if you can use acetone, um, even like brake cleaner, um, but you want to get that oil off there. If you have any kind of a chemical um, on the top of it, you want to strip that off, and then um, you want to make sure you wipe that clear when you're done. Don't use chlorine to brake clean. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Don't use chlorinated brake cleaner because it will give off a toxic gas. Thank you. Um, 
when we get into aluminum, we'll talk more about um, using a stainless steel brush for cleaning aluminum. We, we really want to avoid using a, an angle grinder on aluminum because aluminum is so soft, the angle grinder will dig into it. And anything that has had steel on it in the past, so your angle grinder, um, it will embed some of that steel on your material. So we, we never want to mix anything that's iron-based with aluminum when we get into aluminum. So um, really fresh, clean sandpaper, but a stainless steel brush works good on aluminum. Stainless steel brush will work on here, but I like sandpaper will clean it. Um, and then acid cleaners. So um, the acetone works well on that. That's a good, good cleaner. So now we've got some nice clean metal. Now we can look at setting up our TIG welder. The thing with the TIG welder, it's all about setup. Setup is really, really um, key when we're setting up the TIG welder to weld. If the video that we uh, I put on canvas, he was welding like half inch plate. It was big, thick plate, maybe three eighths inch plate. So he wasn't really worried about his setup. He just slapped a rod in there and threw a cup on there and cranked it up to 125 amps and went. Um, with a quarter inch, we're going to care about that, but if you're doing something this size, setup is absolutely key. You've got to make sure you have your setup right on. So one of the things that I've found I like to do um, is most of the setups are already done for you. You can go, I'm going to quick put my, I'm going to share my screen here really quick. You can use some of the sheets that are available and I'll show you what I have in a second, or you, I'm gonna actually download one of these. If I just go to Miller, um, TIG, Miller TIG setup, um, you can go right here. They've got a really handy little calculator. So we can go right here and we can look at what Miller recommends for their setup. And we're using Miller welders, so it kind of makes a lot of sense. So we can come over here and we can say, okay, what kind of material are we using? Well, we're going to weld on mild steel. Mild steel is not offered here, so we're going to go stainless steel. And I'll show you why in a second. So it says right here, we're going to use a ceramic cup. Um, what else do we look at? Oh, it didn't give us our filler metal um, yet, and it gives me some basic information below there. Then it's saying, what kind of metal thickness are we going to use? Well, I just said we're going to do 16th of an inch. And we'll just, for the sake of argument, say we're doing a butt weld. And now it's calculating it. So check it out. So it's saying, all right, if you're going to do a 16th inch butt weld, we want to use a 1 16th inch diameter rod. Note it's saying that you can use thoriated. However, most people are going to 2% um, seriated, and that's what we're going to use is seriated tungsten. It says the torch cup that we should use is going to be between a quarter and three eighths. Um, and if you look at that video, that corresponds to the number that's on the cup. Typically, the smaller the rod, the lower your amperage, the smaller your cup size can be. The bigger your metal, the bigger your amperage. And if I'm going with bigger amperage, I need a bigger tungsten rod. Hence, I'm going to use a bigger cup. Um, we want to be somewhere between a quarter and three eighths for our cup size. So we have to convert that to sixteenths of an inch. Well, a quarter inch would be four sixteenths. Three eighths would be six sixteenths. That means a number four, a number five, or a number six would all work for a cup size according to this Miller setup. My filler material, we're gonna use a sixteenth of an inch filler material. I will tell you I don't have sixteenth inch filler rod right now. So I'm gonna show you how we're gonna cheat. Um, I've got a really fun little cheat for using, making thin filler rod. Polarity. We're doing a DC electrode negative polarity. Whenever we are TIG welding steel, mild steel and stainless steel, we use DC electrode negative. And on our TIG welder, it doesn't even give you an option to go DC um, positive or DC negative. It just automatically goes DC electrode negative. Amp setting, 50 to 80 amps. Note right here, it says for mild steel, increase the amperage by 10%. So 10% of 50 would be five. So it'd be 55 to 88. 
somewhere in there. So let's just say 60 to 90, somewhere between 60 and 90 amps is where we want to be. We're going to use pure argon. We're going to set our flow rate at 11 cubic feet per hour. Um, I'm not worried about PSI. And then my welding speed should be approximately 12 inches per minute. Okay. So what does all of that mean? I'm going to go back to here. All right. So what does all of that mean for us? That's just basically how we're going to set up our welder. So let's set up the gun with what they were saying first. So they said, what size tungsten rod should we use? What'd they say for tungsten rod? Come on. What size rod did they say, Nick? 2% lanthanated. Yeah, or 2% seriated. And we're going to use a 16th inch rod. So here's something I'm going to show you guys really quick. In the lab, I have big toolbox. You know the toolbox that you want to use because right there it says TIG welder. Inside that toolbox is all of the parts for your for your welder. So you can reach over to the toolbox and I'm gonna pull out six can you guys see that? 16th inch, 2% seriated welding rod. Now, I only have um, the 2% seriated is all I have in there. Seriated is what is recommended for inverter TIG welder, so that's what I purchased. I just stuck with just that type. And there are different materials you can get, but that's what we're going to go with. So, you will notice 16th inch. We've got 16 inch rod. Pull out a 16th inch rod. There we go. There's my tungsten rod. Now, I don't know if you guys can see this or not, but you will notice it's got a gray end on it. And then it's just plain metallic right there. Can you see that gray end right? Can you see that gray end right there? Some rods, if you get into like the thoriated, has an orange end. Um, pure. Uh, pure tungsten, I believe, has a green end. I'm just looking to see if there's any in there. Um, you don't want to use the gray end. We want to keep that on there because that tells us what kind of a rod it is. We're going to use this end of the rod down here. That's the side that we'll weld with. That's the side that we're going to prep. Now, in the video, the guy in the video said, yeah, you need to go over to the grinder and you need to prep your end. How do we prep the end of this? What should it look like? So here's what I'm gonna tell you. Um, I've got a Miller setup sheet here. I, it kind of tells you what to do. I don't think you're gonna be able to see this, but I have it sitting here in the lab. In a nutshell, when we are TIG welding steel, mild steel and stainless steel, we use a pointed tip. On the videos that weld.com video, he showed you you had a pointed tip. When we're welding aluminum, we can use a ball tip. Technically, you can use a pointed tip, but your pointed tip turns into a ball after a while, so it doesn't matter. Um, but we need to put a point on this tip. The finer that point, the better, the tighter your arc coming off of it. If that point gets corroded full of steel, you have to snap it off and we have to resharpen it. Now, how am I going to put a point on that rod right there. What kind of a tool would I use for making that into a point? Tungsten grinder. Yeah, so we could use a grinding wheel. Grinding wheel will work. Um, however, this is tungsten, which is really hard. You will chew up my grinding wheel if you do it. Um, we can use the grinder though, and it does work. What I typically will use is just the belt disc sander. Now, here's the kicker with the belt disc sander. I'm going to show you how to do this. It's not necessarily the best method, but it's the method that works out pretty good for us. Okay, when we are sharpening this, 
if I want to sharpen this, if I put the rod on its side, I'm going to just show you right here. If I put the rod like this and then I sharpen it, what's going to happen is you're going to end up with serrations that go around the rod like this. And that's going to cause your arc to come off in a swirling motion. Your arc's going to come off kind of like a miniature little tornado. We don't want that. We want your arc to come off in a nice tight drive. So in order to do that, I need to make sure the serrations on my tungsten rod go parallel with the rod. The only way we do that is by holding the rod at an upward angle like this and grinding it. You can't really do it on the disc sander, but I can do it on the belt sander. When you're doing this, if you hold the rod like this, if you hold the rod on your hand like that and you go to do this, you're asking to go to the hospital because if that belt grabs that rod, it's going to shove that rod right through your hand. It's going to be sticking right out of your hand just like that. You probably don't want that. We hold on to the rod up here towards the end, just like this. And then we make sure it's off the table. Do not hold it on the table. And then I can just lightly rotate it on the belt right here. If it does kick, it'll just kick back here. And it's not going to tear the belt up. And it's not going to go through your hand. So I want to lightly, lightly is the term here, lightly run it on the belt right there. Now, if we look at this tip, I don't know if you can see it or not, but we made a sharp little point on that tip. And it comes right out to a point. And if we look at it really, really close with a magnifying glass, you're going to see the serrations or the scratches on it run parallel to the tip. So that's how we sharpen it. When you are welding, if you get garbage all over that pointed tip, you need to stop what you're doing. Take the tungsten out. You can either snap that off or you can grind it all the way off and you have to put another point on your tungsten tip. Everybody understand that? And this is part of that setup that's so crucial. Okay, so then what do we do? We've got our tungsten rod. I'm gonna grab the torch really quick. When your torch is done, this is what I showed you the other day. If we look at this torch right here, look at this tungsten tip. See how there's garbage all over it right here? And that's from the last person welding on it. They got a little bit of maybe aluminum on it. I don't know what that is on there. But you don't want all of that all over your tungsten rod. So we need to take that off. We're going to take it off anyway because this tungsten rod is not the right size. This is an eighth inch rod. It's way too big. When you take your torch apart... If somebody leaves it like this, put these back in the appropriate boxes. I have a box for every one of these. So I'm going to take the back, back cap off. I take the collet out. I'm going to take the cone off. And I'm going to unscrew the tool holder. Okay, that's a tool holder. And this was in the that um, weld.com video, so I don't need to go over that a lot again, but I'm just going to show you, I'm just going to reiterate what they did on that video. Okay, components that we have to have for our torch when we're setting it up. We've got our 1 16th inch tungsten rod. If I'm using 1 16th tungsten rod, that means I need to have 1 16th inch collets. I've got a little baggie of collets here. I'm actually got to order some more. I barely have enough collets for all the welders. This is a collet. Here's the kicker on the collet. Can you guys see that little slit in the collet right there? Does that show up on the camera? I'll try to get it in here really close. Uh, let's see here. 
There, can you see that slit right there? That little slit is going to allow the collet to pinch down on the tungsten rod. So when we go to put this on the tungsten rod, the slit goes towards the sharp point. Get in there. Here we go. So it should slide on there, and if I pinch that together, then it's not going to slide. Okay. 16th inch rod, 16th inch collet. Then I need to have 16th inch collet bodies. There's my collet bodies. So we'll open this bag up. Just lost my tungsten rod. And if they're not in the right bag, if they're just floating around because your classmates didn't put them away correctly, it will tell you right on the collet body right here that it's a 1 16th of an inch. Likewise, on the collet, it's going to tell you right here on the base that it is 1 16th of an inch. So it says it right on the collet. It says it right on the collet body what size it is. Okay, so let's assemble this. Watch how I assemble it. Torch body. Very first thing you're going to do is put the collet body in. There's only threads on one side. So you can screw it in. Just as the video, as they said in the weld.com video, you screw that in finger tight. That's it. No tighter than that. I should be able to just unscrew it at any time with my fingers. Okay. There's my collet body in my torch. Then I'm going to take the pointed side of my tungsten rod. See the point on there? The pointed side is going to stick out. So we're going to feed it through just like that. Then I'm going to take my collet. See the collet right there? Notice, everybody look at this. This is the important thing. See how this is flared out on this back side? That flare always goes into the end cap. The end cap right here pushes on that flare. If you put this in backwards and you have the slit side of the collet going into the tail, the tail or the end cap will grab a hold of it and twist the collet up and then your collet is garbage. Make sure this flared out side of the collet is going back to the tail. So I'm gonna slide that on. It's gonna slide right up into the collet body. And then I take my tail or my end cap, make sure the O-ring is in place. If the O-ring's not in place, you're not gonna, the gas won't track in the right direction. And I'm going to lightly snug that up. As soon as I snug up this cap, it locks my tungsten rod in place. It can't go anywhere. When I loosen it, now my tungsten rod will move in and out. Okay. Now, if we recall, on my Miller setup, it said anywhere from a four, five, or six for a ceramic cup. Here's my ceramic cups. It says right here on the side of it. Right here on the side, it says I have a number six. So there's a number six cup. That means it is six sixteenths. That is the diameter of the cup, six sixteenths. So the diameter coming across the front of this is 6 sixteenths or 3 eighths of an inch. I'm going to take that and I'm going to slide it right over the top. These cups are not the right cups. Those are not the right cups. I've just now for the first time opened that box up and I'm looking at them. These are too small a cup. So I'm going to see if I have a number six cup in here. I got to order some more cups. Here, I got a number five cup. Didn't even look at my cups before doing this presentation. So here we go. It's a number five. See the number five on there? So that number five cup is going to go right on my right on my collet body. Now notice the tungsten rod is not sticking out of there. I've got it loosened up. I can just shake it. There's my tungsten rod. Typically, we want to keep that tungsten rod between an eighth and a quarter of an inch. 
the thicker your rod, the farther you can stick it out. The skinnier your rod, the less distance you can stick it out because it's going to, um, this rod gets extremely hot. It'll be glowing red hot. And the gas coming out helps to dissipate some of that heat. Doesn't dissipate all of it, but the thicker rod can maintain the heat a little bit better. So you want to be right about there with your tungsten rod, and then we're going to snug it up. Now that rod's not going anywhere. No, when you snug up that tail, it should be just two fingers slightly snug. That is all you need right there. Now when I'm going to use this, I'm going to hold my torch just like a pencil. Hold it just like, or just like a gas torch. When you guys used a gas torch, it was the same exact thing. Um, so we can run it just like that, okay? Let's take a look at our welder. So I'm going to flip this around. Okay, P.S., if you cannot remember how to set the welder up, if you don't remember that exact setup that I just told you, you can look right here on our TIG welder. Right there is a little diagram of the torch, and it shows exactly how the torch assembles and goes together. So that sits right on the front of the TIG welder. This little door opens and closes. Um, you can just open that up and peek at it. It will show you exactly how that diagram goes together. Now, this is our SyncWave uh, Miller welder. Um, you can see there's not a lot of dials on here. The weld.com video, he had dials and knobs all over the place. We've got two. It's pretty simple compared to the one that they had in that video. I'm going to go ahead and shut this door just to get it out of the way. Okay, so if we turn on our welder, the on switch is right down here. Turn it on. When I turn it on, you can see it fires up right here. It says Sync Wave 210. That's our welder, is a Sync Wave 210. I can switch between welding right here. I have AC TIG, DC TIG, DC stick. When I go to DC stick, stick, I'm now actually doing DC electrode positive. In order to do that, I need to remove the torch and put on an electrode holder. And then I can also do spool gun. Spool gun is over here. Again, I would disassemble, take the torch off, and all of these welders came with a spool gun. We can do spool gun aluminum welding or spool gun uh, stainless welding if we would like um, and we can get into that more when you guys are in the shop right now I just want to show you how to do the basic setup so on that Miller screen that we said it said that we should be running 55 to 88 amps or 60 to 90 no right here is my amp setup um, can you guys see that okay does that show up Jackson okay Right here, I can change my amps. So all I do is just turn the dial and I can turn my amps up or down. I'm going to run, said 66 to 88. I'm just going to go 80. I want to, I always like to be on the high side um, because I can always reduce the amount of heat that I'm putting in. I can't add extra heat if I don't have the amps turned up. So I'm just going to run 80 amps right now. The rest of my setup is found right here under menu. So if I click and hold down menu, I have to hold it to the count of three. Once I hold it to the count of three, it now starts to tell me what's going on right here. Right now, I have it set up to start high frequency. HF is high frequency. So I'm going to get a high frequency start. That means when I first push the pedal for the first couple seconds, it's going to give me a really high frequency that's gonna pour more heat into my metal to get it going. And it's only gonna last for about a second. Then it's gonna kick down to the normal frequency and the normal amp setting. If I wanna turn that off, I just reach over here to my dial and I can see that I have a lift start, which is a different kind of start. We wanna do high frequency right now. If I hit menu again, um, this I don't even, I looked that up and I couldn't even find it. So it's a standard setup. 
I'm not even sure what that one's for. Hopefully I figure that one out in the next couple weeks. Tungsten. Notice the size of my tungsten rod right here. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but it says it's a 332nd. Do we have a 332nd tungsten rod in there? No, we have a 116th inch tungsten rod. So again, we got to turn our dial to get it to 116th of an inch. If I'm going, I can go down to 40 thousandths. Oops. So this will go to 40 thousandths, 16th, 330 seconds, eighth inch. That's the settings that this welder has. So we're going to 116th of an inch. And the post, that is the post flow. So on the TIG welder, it's pumping out argon. It's going to um, shoot argon out while I'm welding. When I'm done welding, we have what we refer to as a post flow. It's going to continue to pump argon out of the gun right here while, <clears throat> while it's off. And that is basically to help protect the tungsten rod from the atmosphere because the tungsten rod is going to be red hot. You recall I said it's red hot. If we had zero post flow on there, the tungsten rod would be red hot and exposed to oxygen in the atmosphere and we'd get um, corrosive buildup all over the tungsten rod. So we want to have that post flow to keep the tungsten rod nice and clean. We can also use that post flow for blowing argon on our weld because our weld's going to be red hot. So I let off my pedal. Um, I still, you know, my metal's still red hot. My, I'm going to have that post flow blowing out and I'm going to just kind of run it back and forth over the weld and it helps protect the weld so it uh, stays nice and clean. We can set this to an exact amount of time. If I want 10 seconds of post flow, which is pretty standard, I can set it to 10 seconds. Right now it's set to auto. When it's on auto, it's basically 10% of whatever the amp setting is. So our amp setting was at 80 amps. 10% of 80 would be 8. So our post flow is going to be 8 seconds. And if we wanted more, I would adjust that and I would turn it up to 10 seconds or whatever I wanted. We're just going to leave it on auto for right now. So now I can hit menu. And it kicks us right back. We're at 80 amps. We're ready to go. So we've got our metal right here. We've got our table clamped or grounded out right here. I showed you the torch setup. That's ready to go right there. The one thing I haven't showed you, a couple things I haven't showed you is the gas setup. So we got to come over here to the end of our welding booth. At the end of our welding booth is this guy right here. Okay. Let me get in here. Right. So this, this is our argon tank. We're using pure argon because um, that's, we're going to use pure argon when we're welding mild steel, stainless steel, aluminum. If we get into some exotic welding, we can use um, a little bit of helium, but argon is predominantly what we're gonna use. I have the regulator already set so that we have enough pressure for all the TIG welders to run. All you need to do is turn on your argon. So when I turn that on, you'll see I've got that set right now so that I can flow up to 40 cubic feet per minute. This is actually a flow gauge and right here on the flow gauge, it says CFH. So cubic feet, I not cubic feet per minute, cubic feet per hour. So it's set up where it can flow 20 cubic feet per hour. And that is running through this hose into our manifold. So every station can set their very own argon flow rate. So when I come over here, see if we can get this up here. I'm in a little bit of a light spot here. Okay, so right here is my main valve for my argon. I'm going to crack that valve on. Hold on a second. I didn't see the question. Let me pop back there. Gabe, you're just showing up. Good enough. 
Thanks for being here, Gabe. Okay, so I turned on turned on my main valve right here. You'll notice it didn't come up very high, but I should be able to turn on my flow rate right here. I want this set between, well, it's set 11 cubic feet per hour. That seems a little on the low side for me. Typically, I tell students they should be setting at 15 to 20, but we are using pretty low amps. We're using a pretty small cup. So let's just go with their recommendations. I'm at zero. I don't know if you can see this. Zero's right here, 20's right there. I'm gonna go a little better than halfway. So there it is right there, we're a little better than halfway. If I, hold on, bear with me while I turn on the welder. Okay, so I turned my welder on. When I turn the welder on, that would explain a lot. I was in the wrong booth. Let's go over one booth. There we go. So right now this flow gauge is set at about 26. I'm gonna drop it down. Let's get between 10 and 15 cubic feet per hour. Oop. They're very, very touchy. So there we go, we're now set at about 15 cubic feet per hour, so we're a little more argon than what we actually need. If you're a little high, it shouldn't really matter. Now, how are we gonna do this? When you are using the TIG welder, when we're using the TIG welder, you control the TIG welder with this foot pedal, I'm trying to get you a shot of the foot pedal. We're going to control it with that foot pedal right there. When we're pushing that foot pedal, you got to think of this as driving a car. Think about it like driving a car. If you've never driven a car, I apologize, but it's the best analogy that you can use. If you're sitting at a stop sign, how much gas are you giving the car? We're not giving it anything because we're stopped. We're dead, right? When I don't want to go, I don't give it any gas. So I'm sitting at a stoplight, waiting for the light to turn green. Light turns green. What do you do? What do you do when the light turns green? You can it, right? You put, the, you put your pedal to the floor. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold our torch right down here. We're going to put the pedal right to the floor. When you put the pedal to the floor, you're at the full 80 amps. And you're at that high frequency start. So we're going to get a really big shot and we're going to get an electric arc that's going to go from our tungsten rod to our metal. The, tung the arc is going to act just like our oxyacetylene flame. It's going to melt our metal and it's going to give us a liquid pool. That liquid pool is going to be just like when we were gas welding. We want to push that liquid pool along nice and slow and steady, just like we did with the flame. Now I will tell you, um, better TIG welders than me, as well as in that video, will tell you that you should just push this along nice and smooth and straight. I always seem to be able to get the best results if I do a little bit of a weave. And when I say a little bit of a weave, I mean, I don't know if you can even see that, but I'm doing itty bitty little counterclockwise circles. Um, I need to practice more and maybe use using this better equipment, it'll be easier for me. I want to learn how to do it where I can just push it along nice and straight and steady. That's how we should do it. But you're going to put the pedal to the floor. Boom, we got our pedal to the floor. If you're in your car, you put your pedal to the floor. Once you get your car up to 55 miles an hour, what do you do with your throttle? What do you do with the pedal? Do you let all the way off? No, you back off the throttle so that you can hold it right at that nice steady 55 miles an hour. We do the same thing here. We're gonna put the pedal to the floor. We're gonna get an arc. The arc's gonna generate a puddle for us. Once we have a puddle, that's equivalent to the car going 55 miles an hour. Once we have a puddle, we back off the throttle and we try to hold the throttle right at the exact point that we need to be to hold the puddle while we push it along at approximately 12 inches per minute. 
If you don't know how fast 12 inches per minute is with your hand, don't worry. Either do I. We just know that 12 inches in a minute, it's 12 inches over 60 seconds. So 60 divided by 12 is going to be, uh, what, four, five? It's going to be five. It should take you about five seconds to go one inch. So if you think about it, it's going to be one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, five, one thousand. It's about that speed right there. It's just nice, slow, steady speed. If you're off, you're not quite there, don't worry about it. I will tell you, I never count to see how fast I'm going. I watch the size of the puddle. I want the puddle approximately pinky nail size. And with this thin metal, it's probably going to be smaller than that. It's probably going to be half the size of my pinky nail. Um, thinner metal is going to have smaller puddle. So I'm, I'm just watching the puddle. And as soon as I have the puddle the right size, I'm just pushing it ahead. One thing to note, we do not drag the TIG welder. You only push the TIG welder. Because we're blowing gas out of here, if you're dragging it backwards, you don't have argon around your weld as you're welding. So we always push it so that we have argon flooding the weld zone as we're pushing it along. Okay? Now, what about a filler rod? If you recall on the Miller setup, it said use a 1 16th inch filler rod. I don't have 16th inch filler rod on hand right now. Um, I need to go to Winnick and get some stainless steel brushes, so I'll probably get some 16th inch filler rods. This, this is your cheat. Where are you going to find this? Because we have a lot of it. This is... Lake wire. Yep, it's just MIG wire. You can take 35 thousandths MIG wire, which is what this is, or 30 thousandths MIG wire, spool out a great big length of it, and we double it up. And what I like to do is I just take this, I clamp this end right in the vise, I clamp this end in a drill, and we just twist it. And when you twist it together, you now have a 65 to 70 thousandths filler rod, which is a 16th of an inch. So if we twist that up, this isn't a very good twist. I'm just kind of doing it on the fly. Um, if I twist that up, now I have 16th inch filler rod. That's exactly what you need for your filler rod. So when we're going to run with this, the whole key to adding filler rod, it's actually very similar to gas welding in that I'm just pushing my torch ahead and I'm gonna keep dipping my filler rod right on the leading edge of my puddle. So as I'm going along, I go dip, 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 dip. And it, remember, this is exactly the same as oxyacetylene. The torch does not melt your filler rod. What should melt your filler rod? Same principle in gas welding. What melts the filler rod? It's not the torch steel the liquid puddle mm -hmm. your liquid puddle right here is what's going to melt your filler rod so once you have a liquid puddle you're dipping this on that front edge of that liquid puddle the liquid puddle melts your filler rod and it draws the filler rod right into it if you have a nice liquid puddle then your your filler will uh, melt and it will absorb straight into the puddle and it will fill real nicely if you don't have a puddle, then you're melting it with the torch, and then all you get is big blobs and clods on there, and you don't get good penetration, and you don't have a good well. Okay? So um, it's basically just like using a gas torch, except for I'm controlling the heat with my foot pedal, and it's all about maintaining a puddle. Now, other things that he did not talk about in his video, um, TIG welding is just like MIG welding in regards to safety equipment. So when we're welding, you need to have your number 10 lens helmet on. And if you start doing heavy TIG welds, TIG welding is actually brighter than MIG welding. You may have to turn it up to 11 or 12. Very, very frequently you'll be running your helmet at a 12. Um, one of the things that he points out in the videos, you got to be able to see. 
seeing your puddles, seeing your weld is absolutely crucial. Make sure your helmet is nice and clear on the outside as well as the inside. Likewise, when you are welding, you need to have a green flame retardant jacket on. TIG welding does not throw sparks like wire feed or arc, so that's good. We like that. But you're still dealing with molten metal, so you need to have a green flame retardant jacket on. You also need to have gloves on. Here's a kicker. Um, I'm looking for my gloves. Hold on a second. If you are trying to TIG weld with big, heavy-duty arc welding gloves, it's very difficult to hold this fine filler wire, and it's very hard to control the torch. I actually have welding gloves that are finer. They're real thin leather. They're not going to protect your hands like these will from picking up hot metal, but they will protect your hands from the light, and they're going to protect your hands from the heat. Um, you just make sure you're not picking up the hot metal with those gloves. And you shouldn't be picking up the hot metal with these gloves either. So we always pick up our metal with our players to cool it off. But I have those gloves in the back closet. They're specifically for TIG welding. Only wear the TIG welding gloves for TIG welding um, just because they're finer and I don't want to burn them up. So we need a helmet. We need our gloves. We need a jacket. And then we're going to have players. Um, likewise, we want to make sure we have good ventilation. Uh, you're going to get a lot of the same gases welding steel here as you would if you were arc welding or uh, oxy, or, um, excuse me, wire feed welding. When we get into aluminum and stainless steel, there's actually a bunch of other really nauseous gases that come off. So then we really need to make sure we're getting good ventilation because some of those gases can be quite bad for you and we don't want to be breathing them. Okay. Questions at this point in time. So I I would show you a TIG weld right now, but I know that the camera won't record it. Um, and I don't have my stuff on anyway. But essentially, when you come in, you're going to set up the TIG welder just like I showed you right now. You are going to go through and we're going to just practice running stringer beads. We're just going to try to get a stringer bead. And like I said, it's going to be very, very similar to gas welding. This thing is basically, it's a torch. And we even refer to it as a torch. Um, it's going to operate just like a torch, making a liquid puddle, just like a torch. And we're going to push it along just like we push the torch. So the use of it is just like the oxyacetylene. The upside to it is we can control that amperage with our foot pedal. Why We set our welder to 80 amps. Wide open, we're pushing out 80 amps. If I want less heat, I back off to a half throttle, three quarters throttle. Now I can control my puddle size. Um, and when you're moving that pedal up and down, you, you're, you're adjusting the amperage, but you're actually adjusting the frequency at which the amperage is coming out. So it gets kind of complicated. Just remember using the gas pedal is just like working the gas pedal on a car. More gas, more heat. Less throttle, less heat. We want to stop to the stop sign. We let off the pedal all the way. So using the, the gas pedals, just like a gas pedal on a car. Okay. Questions on TIG welding. Any questions? Who here thinks they would like to try to come in Friday and do some TIG welding? Nobody. Okay. Um, I will tell you, we're going to keep looking at TIG welding. I encourage you to try to come in and do some TIG welding. Um, likewise, if you want to come in and work with the wire feed welders more, you can. Um, and wire feed welding is great. But as you get better at welding, you want to learn how to TIG weld. If you can wire feed weld, most companies are going to go, hey, yay, good for you. You know how to turn a welder on. You know how to wire feed weld. Just like I told you in beginning welding, though, I can train a blind monkey how to wire feed weld. If you can TIG weld, you now are very employable. There's a lot of companies in the Forest Lake area that are begging for people that can TIG weld. And it's a, it's a real good starter out of the gate for you. I will tell you if you're looking at getting into pipe fitting, or any kind of tank construction, 
or any kind of exotic metal welding. All of that is TIG welding. It's, it's all predominantly TIG welded because of the amount of control that we can use and the amount of materials we can weld with it. Um, fabrication welding, that's mostly wire feed welding, but TIG welding is the real skill. So I want to get you guys in here at some point in time, and I'm hoping that every one of you have the opportunity to use the TIG welder as we move ahead. Okay. Any questions? Before you log off, review, what do you have to have done for this week? You need to watch the weld.com video that's already on Canvas and do that worksheet. That's one. I'm going to have this presentation on Canvas as well as the worksheet that goes hand in hand with it. If you don't feel like you need to watch the video again, just skip it and go right to the worksheet. But if there's questions on the worksheet that you don't remember, you can go back to the video and review this presentation right now. That worksheet needs to get done. Um, and I'm going to probably have one more short video on for Friday that's just going to be a video on how to TIG weld like tubing or anything like that. Um, be aware, since we're talking about videos, if you go on to YouTube or anything like that, even weld.com is guilty of this. Um, it's real easy. If you look up videos on TIG welding, everybody wants to know about walking the cup. Walking the cup is basically when they start laying the cup on here and they rock the cup back and forth. It's basically doing a giant weave is all it is. Um, don't even think about walking the cup right now. Don't even think about or worry about getting into that kind of stuff. That's like way advanced um, pipe fitter kind of welding. Um, and quite frankly, if you back up and look at last week's video, we already know weaving isn't as strong as doing smaller, numerous stringer beads. Uh, smaller, numerous stringer beads is a better weld anyway. Walking the cup is really about making a really sexy wide weld that looks cool. Um, and it has its place, but there's all kinds of YouTubes on walking the cup. Ignore them for right now. All you care about is how do we fire the torch and move ahead? So weld.com, setting up and using the TIG welder, worksheet for this presentation, and there'll be one other video that I'm going to have on there for Friday. Um, I may or may not have a worksheet with it just because I'm not going to worksheet you guys to death. I'm hoping you can come in, sign up for Open Lab. Okay? Questions? If you have questions, I'm just trying to shut off my recording right now. Darn it. Um, if you have any questions and you want to talk about anything, you can 